Thank you, Dr. Sumi, and good afternoon to everyone. Today, uh, we will talk about uh, converting from two-way travel time measurements to depth measurements. And the little diagram here on the right is the true depth. Uh, we have sand and shale sitting on top of a limestone. It looks like a little bit of a, a limestone uh, carbonate buildup. And because the limestone has a faster velocity than the encasing sands and shales, on a time section, we get something that's called pull-up. So that's just a little teaser for what we'll be talking about. Uh, this slide uh, mentions the uh, terms for use of the uh, webinar material and the uh, PowerPoint and the exercises that, that go along with it. Uh, essentially, uh, the intent is for this to be used by uh, full-time students or uh, uh, professors and uh, teaching staff that uh, train uh, full-time students. It's not to be used for uh, people already uh, out of um, university and uh, working especially in oil and gas field. So for today, our objectives are the four that are listed here. Uh, understand the importance of time depth conversion. Uh, talk about some uh, basics about velocity. How we choose a time depth conversion for the area that we're looking at and how we apply some corrections. So when is time depth important? Uh, it's essentially important in every phase of exploration, development, and production. And so we can start here on the left uh, when we're doing our seismic survey planning. Uh, the true depth is important. Uh, we acquire and process our data. Uh, we map it in two-way time. We want to turn that into maps in uh, feet or in meters. Uh, velocity and time depth is important when we're considering the prediction of rock and fluid properties. Uh, depth is very important when we're planning wells. Uh, it's also important when we're trying to integrate the seismic with log data or core data. Uh, VSP is vertical seismic profile uh, and check shots. And if we have uh, post well appraisal, again, the importance of uh, depth uh, is, uh, is key. So uh, there are some uh, pitfalls if we are interpreting seismic that is in a vertical scale of two-way travel time. Uh, if we have lithologies that have anomalously high velocities, such as limestones, uh, then we can get pull-up in the time domain. And so in order to get a proper depth conversion, we have to remove that uh, pull-up, which could give us a false structure. So here uh, we have a true depth structure. So the units here on the vertical axis would be uh, meters or feet. Uh, we assign some velocities to those and calculate the two-way travel time. And the um, uh, boundary between the tan and the blue is accurate. But the boundary between the blue and green, which should be flat, is artificially pulled up. And if you were thinking you had a target in the green portion of the section and thought you had an anticline in this position, uh, you would uh, find out that uh, that was not correct. The um, opposite is correct if we uh, is uh, the opposite is true. Uh, if we have low velocities, uh, such as a gas sand where the velocities are less than the uh, uh, velocities to either side, uh, we have a true depth structure that has a little bit of a, a high in the uh, deepest uh, green layer. And if we use the uh, velocities that are shown here, we actually get a sag. And so instead of having an anticline, which is uh, the true answer in depth on the two-way travel time, it would look like we have a little bit of a syncline. So uh, knowing that uh, we can get anomalies uh, because of uh, lateral changes in velocities, that's an important lesson for seismic interpreters to understand. Uh, I have here uh, three examples. Here's a flat water bottom. Here's a water bottom dipping uh, left to right. And here is a uh, rugose or, or rough uh, water bottom. And we'll keep the structure the same. And so these are three different depth sections uh, showing three conditions of the water bottom. 
If we converted that uh, into time using uh, uh, representative velocities, we would get this. And in red is the true depth structure. The brown is the time structure. Where the water bottom is flat, uh, we get no distortion. But if we have a dipping water bottom, then the time uh, structure and the depth structure would not totally match. And if we have a rugose water bottom, we can see that in two-way travel time, some of the oscillations or undulations on the water bottom are coming in as false time structure. There are a number of controls on velocity. The three primary ones are the ones with the check marks and the bold, the age of the rocks, the depth of the rocks, and the type of lithology that we're working with. Uh, burial history, uh, which uh, translates into compaction state, is also important. And uh, the structural history, uh, uplift and erosion, is also important. Temperature pressure, uh, places where we might have abnormal pressure, can also be important. We have uh, different sources for velocity information. If we have wells uh, and we've run a sonic log, that gives us uh, some information about the velocities. Uh, that's uh, kind of the lowest quality uh, velocity information. Uh, I talked uh, previously about check shots and uh, vertical seismic profiles, VSP surveys. Uh, that gives us velocity information as well. And if we have an area where we have, uh, for a particular uh, top, uh, formation top, we have the depth in feet from the wells, and we know what that corresponds in two-way travel time, so we have the seismic times, then we can calculate what the velocity would, ne would need to be so that the depth and the time uh, are uh, consistent and we call those pseudo velocities. From uh, seismic data alone, without uh, presence of wells, uh, we have stacking velocities, and from that we can get average velocities, and uh, I'll talk about the Dix equation in a couple minutes here, we can get interval velocity. And uh, if we do high-end processing uh, using tomography, we can get uh, travel times and velocities uh, from doing seismic inversion. A couple of definitions, uh, if we're talking about uh, velocities that we get from well data, we can get interval velocities. Uh, we take the interval thickness and divide it by the interval time. Uh, we can get average velocities uh, down to a certain depth, what would be the appropriate average velocity so that we get the correct uh, two-way travel time. And R RMS stands for root mean square. Uh, and that um, is uh, something that we can get uh, as well from our um, wells or from our seismic. Uh, we can get it from check shot data or we can integrate the sonic log. If we just have seismic uh, derived velocities, uh, we can get the new uh, normal move out NMO velocity. That's uh, something that we get when we process the data. That's the velocity that uh, flattens the gathers for us. And then we can use the uh, Dix equation to get interval velocities. And that's what I'll show uh, the Dix equation on the next slide. So here we have depth in uh, units of uh, feet or meters and two-way travel time. And so uh, we can see how with depth, the velocity or the two-way travel time increases. Uh, the blue dashed lines represent the average velocity so uh, let's say I have uh, four, five check shots, one, two, three, four, five. That would give me uh, pairs. Uh, we know the depth of the uh, hydrophone, or I'm sorry, the geophone. Uh, we also know the, the one-way time, uh, and so we can get two-way time for the energy to get to that uh, geophone. And so we can come up with an average velocity, uh, Z, divided by the time divided by two, if we're talking about two-way travel time. We can use something called the Dix equation, uh, and we can get uh, an interval velocity between any successive uh, pair of uh, check shots. And so we can look at what's the difference in depth versus the, the divided by the difference in time. And again, the two comes in if we're talking about two-way travel time. 
here's the Dick's equation, and we can get uh, interval velocity from that. Uh, we uh, would like to have the RMS root mean square uh, velocity for a layer and its time, uh, a, a shallower uh, velocity and time, and then the time for the deeper and the shallower uh, reference horizon. So uh, the Dick's equation gives us an interval velocity. Uh, a lot of times what we will do is we'll assume that the NMO velocity is equal to approximately at least the RMS velocity. And so instead of RMS, uh, we'll stick in the NMO velocity in this equation. Uh, and the NMO velocity comes from our seismic data processing. So if we have sonic logs from wells or a VSP, uh, then we can derive the interval velocity and the average velocity, similar to the graph that I showed uh, two slides ago. If we just have seismic data alone, we can use the Dick's equation if we assume that the NMO velocity is uh, a good approximation for the RMS. And this assumption that NMO velocity is equal to uh, approximately RMS velocity is uh, valid if the reflectors are planar and don't have any dip on them. There's no lateral velocity changes. And the shot to geophone offset is small compared to the depth of the reflector that we're studying. And of course, uh, these are pretty constraining uh, requirements. And uh, a lot of times in the areas where we are exploring, uh, these may not be totally accurate. So uh, if I have a particular area that I'm studying, and I'll use the uh, Gippsland uh, Basin example that a lot of the exercises have been uh, uh, based on, uh, what's the proper time depth conversion uh, that I should use? So the choice of how we go from time to depth uh, depends on several factors. Uh, what's the objective of the exploration uh, problem? Are we trying to uh, figure out which blocks to bid on? Are we trying to figure out if we should drill a wildcat well and at what location? Uh, what's the nature or complexity of the subsurface? What's the complexity of the velocity structure, especially uh, lateral velocity changes? What type of velocity data do I have available? Do I have some velocities from well data or is it strictly from seismic data processing? The uh, time that I have to do the conversion and how many dollars do I have to, to uh, spend on doing a time to depth conversion? So a reliable depth conversion will tie the existing wells uh, and the predicted depths accurately away from our well control. So our basic methodology, the first step is to QC the data that we have and then to analyze that data, uh, well data if we have it, uh, seismic uh, data if that's all that we have. Uh, we would consider the velocity complexity, uh, especially how significant our lateral velocity changes we want to determine the optimum time to depth method and then perform the depth conversion. And then finally, we would validate our depth conversion uh, using any uh, wells that we do have in our study area. So uh, this is a chart compares the well velocity information versus seismic velocity information. With the well velocity, uh, it's easy to interpret and we have detailed information at the well location, or if we have several wells, the well locations. The disadvantages of well velocity is its low data density. Uh, we typically only have a few wells in the area that we're looking at. We may have to edit the well information for some borehole effects, and I talked about that uh, previously in an earlier session. We would like to have minimal lateral velocity changes. Uh, there is no consideration for structural dip if we're just using uh, a limited number of uh, well velocities. And there's no information below the total depth of the wells. Seismic velocities, the advantage is we can have very high data density. 
Uh, we can get information about vertical and horizontal uh, variations in velocity. Uh, we don't need well data, and we can calibrate the seismic velocities uh, with well data if we have them. The disadvantages of seismic velocities is that it does require extensive processing. Uh, the DIX assumptions must be satisfied, so uh, ideally the layers would uh, have very little dip and we wouldn't have much in the way of um, lateral velocity changes. It does uh, take a lot of uh, high quality analysis to perform and there are limitations in terms of uh, how much resolution we can get out of the seismic data. Uh, again, uh, comparing well and well plus seismic velocities, uh, we can use the well velocities if we have fairly simple geology and minor lateral velocity changes. And typically this would be for a small study area such as a field that uh, we have several wells within. Uh, example of how we would use the well data, we could construct a constant function or we can generate what are called depth slices, and I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. If we're well, using well plus seismic velocities, we can handle more complex uh, geology. We can handle significant uh, lateral velocity changes, and we can do this for a larger area uh, with only a few wells uh, with a better degree of confidence. Some of the methods, uh, we can use time slices, uh, horizon-based interval velocities, or we can generate some detailed velocity models. So I'm going to talk more about these uh, uh, examples or methods uh, in the next uh, section. Uh, should I use average velocities or should I use interval velocities? Uh, here is uh, depth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, velocity variations as a function of depth. Uh, if the velocities increase steadily with depth, which is uh, normally the case, uh, and there's no big step changes, then average velocity methods are probably going to work fine. If as a function of depth, I see some uh, stair stepping back and forth of the velocities, then it's uh, probably worthwhile doing the extra effort to get interval velocities and use an interval velocity method. So here's kind of the guts of the lecture. Uh, these are five different types of uh, time to depth conversion methods. Uh, I'll talk about these uh, in series. Uh, so the first is to use a single constant velocity versus depth function. So uh, this is used uh, throughout the study area. And so we'll look at uh, uh, velocity as a function of depth. Uh, if we want to use a linear approximation, uh, then depth is a uh, constant A plus a constant B times the time. And uh, the purple line would represent that linear fit to the depth data. Uh, we could make that a second or even a third order fit. So here we have a constant, a constant times uh, time to the first power plus another constant times time to the second power. So these are simple, they are fast, and they are cheap. Uh, they're okay for small areas where we have fairly simple geology, but they tend to be the least accurate method in terms of predicting uh, depth from two-way travel time away from our well control. The second method is to use average velocity maps. And so for this to uh, be applicable, we have to have uh, a series of wells. In this example, I have four wells. I'm looking at the top Latrobe horizon or the top Latrobe unconformity, something that uh, if you have been doing the exercises, uh, you have been working with. So in well A, the uh, TOL horizons at uh, 1755 meters, which corresponds to 900 milliseconds a depth and a time at well B, a depth and a time at well C, a depth and a time at well D. And so from that, we can compute at each of the wells what the uh, average velocity uh, down to the top Latrobe horizon is, and then we can contour that up. And then if we have the depths uh, to the top Latrobe 
in uh, two-way travel time. We can multiply it by the velocity map that uh, we've just generated from contouring up the four data points, uh, divide it by two since we're talking about two-way travel time, and that would give us a depth map. The third method is to uh, generate time slices or depth slices. Our starting point for this method is to have good quality and fairly high density velocity model. Uh, the seismic cube in time is sliced at a constant time values over small increments. So we might slice our two-way time volume every 400 milliseconds. For each of these slices, we would convert from time to depth based on the velocity model that's uh, developed for the area. And then uh, that resulting time depth relationship would be used to convert the seismic cube from a uh, vertical scale of uh, milliseconds, two-way travel time, uh, to depth, either uh, feet or meters. So here's an example. I might have a, a slice at the sea level uh, 400 milliseconds below, 800 below, uh, 1200 below. And for the times and the velocity model, I can then come up with depth contours for each of these slices. And then I can linearly interpolate in between each of these slices to get a depth cube. The fourth method is horizon keyed interval velocities. Uh, this is the one that I think is used uh, most commonly. Uh, our starting point is to have a set of seismically mapped uh, seismic sequence boundaries or uh, horizons or formation tops, uh, whichever terminology you prefer. We would need interval velocity data sequence by sequence. Uh, if it's an offshore uh, data set, the first layer would be the water, the sea, sea water layer, and we can convert that uh, uh, to thickness in units of feet or meters using a constant velocity. Um, and if uh, we're using metric, uh, the seawater has a velocity of about 1,500 meters per second. If we're using English uh, units with feet, uh, roughly uh, seawater is 5,000 feet per second. Uh, the shallowest sequence is converted to thickness in feet or meters by multiplying the isochron uh, by the appropriate interval velocity. And then we just uh, do this uh, sequence by sequence by sequence to build up a depth model. So here's an example. Uh, here we have a cross section. The first uh, layer is the water column, uh, 1,500 meters per second. Uh, we have a tan layer, layer one, uh, purple layer, layer two, green, uh, yellow, and then uh, dark red. And so if the first layer is water, we can get the time thickness of that, uh, multiply that by 1500 meters per second, which is the velocity, and that would give me the water thickness in meters. And so I can get the sea floor uh, depth in meters. Then I can look at the second interval. What's its time thickness? multiply it by its uh, interval velocity, uh, in this example, 1675 meters per second. And then that thickness I can add to the depth of the uh, top of the layer, and I can get the depth to the base of layer one. Similarly, I get the time thickness for layer two, uh, uh, multiply that by its interval velocity, and then add that uh, to the uh, base of layer one to get the uh, base of layer two. And I can do that for layer three and layer four and layer five. So I can do that uh, layer by layer uh, where my layers are defined by my uh, mapped seismic horizons. And then the uh, fifth method that uh, is commonly used is a layer cake. That's a combination of uh, one, two, three, and four. And so here is an example. Again, this is a line from the uh, area that uh, you've been working in the exercise, Gippsland Basin. Uh, this is the Barracuda anticline. And so uh, if you work the exercise associated with this lecture, you'll be working with this particular line. And you'll notice I have uh, uh, columns A 
out through uh, J, and each of the main layers are um, represented by the water bottom reflection, the aqua horizon, the gold horizon, the blue horizon, the orange horizon, and then the magenta horizon. So these would give me uh, one, two, three, four, five layers to get to the upper latrobe uh, or top latrobe unconformity. And uh, I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. There are some more advanced methods for time to depth conversion. Uh, one is to do a dense velocity analysis. So instead of uh, doing uh, a velocity analysis on the order of, uh, say, um, uh, two kilometers by two kilometers, uh, maybe we would do it uh, more on the order of 50 meters by 50 meters. Uh, we can do post-stack depth migration. We could do pre-stack depth migration, or we could use tomography to get us a very detailed uh, velocity model and then use that uh, velocity model to do our time to depth conversions. Once we uh, do have a method to convert from time to depth, uh, what we have to do is consider uh, how well we match the well data. And so here I have three wells, and the numbers represent the mistie, how many uh, uh, feet or meters uh, difference is there between the seismic-based prediction of depth and what the well is telling us. So in this case, uh, uh, plus 170, uh, let's say feet, uh, minus 65, and minus 40. So we can flex our, um, our depth uh, in order to remove those errors. Uh, let's say we're trying to predict the depth to the um, top of the formation of interest uh, at the uh, position of the red. Uh, what's the right correction there? We can use a simple flexing model, but it's better to think about what's causing the missed high errors, and is there something geologically uh, associated uh, with the missed ties that then I can be a little smarter in how to correct um, the uh, depth at the position that I want to uh, drill at. So do, do, to do the depth calibration, the first step is to calculate what the missed ties are between the well data and the predicted uh, depth using the time to depth conversion on the seismic. Try to figure out what's causing those missed ties uh, one possibility is there's an interpretation error, and uh, we don't have the same uh, stratigraphically equivalent horizon at each location. Uh, there might be a resolution problem, or maybe we've just uh, misinterpreted uh, the formation tops. We'd make uh, uh, necessary corrections uh, if we have some errors that we've picked up in step two then we would uh, come up with uh, an understanding uh, of what the geologically, uh, geological nature for the mist ties are, and then we can do a more intelligent uh, analysis of what the residual errors are and how to flex the data in order to um, correct the, uh, the time predictions. So this is a summary, uh, time depth conversion is important throughout the uh, cycle from exploration to development to production. Uh, we wanna integrate geologic knowledge in order to do a good depth conversion. We wanna use the op optimal time depth method uh, for our particular area. Uh, we have to worry about uh, how compaction controls velocities. Uh, if uh, we use a single function if we use uh, average velocity maps, or if we use time slices. If we're in a more complicated uh, velocity area, uh, then we may want to use horizon keyed uh, interval velocities or a layer cake method where we use uh, different uh, methods for different uh, uh, intervals. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the exercise. Uh, here's the Barracuda High, the hot colors are shallower times, uh, going down to the purples, which are the deeps. And uh, so the line uh, northwest to southeast is shown here. And again, I've uh, labeled uh, positions A through J. If I look at position D on the next slide, 
This is the uh, velocity semblance. And so I'm looking for where the hotter colors are. Uh, I could use a simple uh, linear fit uh, and get an equation. So the velocity is the two-way time times uh, 860 plus one, uh, uh, 1,500. Uh, that uh, is probably not going to give me a very good time to depth uh, because it looks like the velocity step up and then step back. Uh, this is the two-way travel time for my different horizons. Uh, so this would be what I would see on a seismic section. If I use that simple linear uh, function at every location, uh, this is how those horizons would convert uh, in units of meters. If instead of using a linear fit, the uh, uh, dash black line, I said, uh, well, each of these major layers has a different interval velocity, and the Miocene in particular has an anomalously high velocity, and turns out there are carbonates in that particular layer, then I could define an interval velocity for each of my intervals and bootstrap myself down, figuring out uh, from the time of the water uh, bottom, uh, get, getting its depth, then getting the thickness of the Pleistocene in time, multiplying it by the uh, interval velocity associated with that interval, and uh, adding that to get the depth uh, to the uh, uh, purple horizon, similarly getting the depth to the yellow, and then the whatever color that is, and then the orange, uh, and then down to the um, uh, top of the reservoir. So here is that uh, cross-section uh, west to east. I have the water layer, that's layer one, that's got a constant velocity of 1,500 meters per second. Uh, for the Pleistocene, I have a velocity, the upper Pliocene a velocity, the lower Pliocene a different uh, interval velocity. For the Miocene, it's uh, fairly fast because that's where the carbonates are. And then uh, layer uh, five, uh, the Miocene, and layer six, the lake entrance. And so what I'm trying to do is calculate the depth of this uh, magenta horizon. And what I'm going to use is a constant velocity for the water layer and then interval velocities uh, for the rest of the layers. So here again is the uh, two-way time section. And if I use that uh, simple, uh, each layer has a constant velocity, interval uh, velocity, then this would be the depths that I would calculate. And so here's a comparison. This is using the single time depth function. Uh, this is in meters. This is using this, the interval velocities uh, to get the, uh, the thicknesses and uh, adding them together to get the depths. And you can see that there's quite a difference between the depth prediction for the top of the magenta using a single equation versus using the interval velocities. Uh, we may have more detailed information. And in this case, uh, we have different velocities up dip versus down dip. And so this would be a place where using a single uh, interval velocity for each of the layers uh, uh, could be uh, refined even more to give us a more accurate uh, prediction of the depth to the top of a horizon, such as the magenta top of the reservoir. Okay. So uh, that con concludes my uh, prepared remarks. I'll turn the microphone back over to Dr. Sumi and see if we have any questions. Well, thank you, Fred, for that presentation today. Um, as Fred is showing on this calendar, you can see that we are going to take an extended break. Um, and we'll meet back up again on Thursday, October 26th and discuss seismic inversion. And we'll finish out the last six uh, lectures. So we'll, uh, we'll finish up on November 14th. So thank you for those who have stuck with us since June when we kind of started all of this. And, and thank you, Fred, for circling that, that. Yeah, we're not meeting again until October 26th. So um, there aren't any questions so far, Fred. I'll give it another minute. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll take a second to kind of see if anybody has 
um, any particular questions that they'd like to ask. Again, you can type it in into the questions box on your webinar control panel um, if you have any. All And if any uh, pop up uh, afterwards, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to get those questions to Fred um, independently. So, all right, well, um, no questions have come through so far, Fred. So with that, um, <laughs> with that, I'll conclude today's seminar and hope to see all of you on October 26th. All right, take care, everyone. Hey, thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. All right, great. Bye. Bye-bye.